You're listening to the Based on History podcast. All units, Irene. I say again, Irene. And we're going to kick him in the ass. We're going to kick the hell out of him all the time. And we're going to go through him like crap through a goose. You tell him I'm coming. And hell's coming with me, you hear? Hell's coming with me. That they may take our lives. But they'll never take our freedom. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Howdy everyone, welcome back to the Based on History podcast, and today we've got another Based on History mini for you, and that's going to be with the movie Tombstone, and some of the weapons, armor, and tactics that they use in that movie. Now, they obviously don't wear any armor, and there's not really any tactics, although we will talk a little bit about it, but mainly we're going to be talking about the weapons that they use in the movie. So, without further ado, we'll just jump right in, and we're going to talk about the main weapon that you see in the movie, and probably the most famous weapon, definitely in Western movies, but probably in all of the West in general, and that's the Colt Peacemaker. It was made in 1873 when they first came out. Throughout its lifetime, they've Colt has sold somewhere in the 450 to 500,000 range of these pistols. It's chambered in 45 Long Colt, and then they came out with another version in 4440 Winchester. That was to be compatible with the Winchester rifle at the time, and we'll get to that a little bit later. But it's a single action revolver, meaning you have to cock the hammer every single time you want to fire. You can't just pull the trigger over and over and over again, like double action revolvers or you know semi-automatic that have gas-powered uh, systems. So you have to physically cock that hammer back every single time you want to fire a bullet from this gun. These pistols were extremely tough, extremely reliable, and that's why people love them, especially once they came out with the Peacemaker with the 4440 that was compatible with the rifle. That meant that people on the frontier and throughout the West only had to carry one type of cartridge that could fit in both their pistol and rifle, meaning they would save down on weight, they would save down on, on money. So after that, it really just it exploded even more. And when you look at the Colt Peacemaker and its evolution from the early, early uh, pistols that Colt was making, it's kind of just the next step in firearm evolutions. We'll talk about Colt revolver history just for a little bit, just because, well, they're, they're not any of them are really in the movie, but I think they're kind of cool. So we'll just kind of talk about it for a little bit. When you look at the evolution of firearms in general, and you've got the kind of Kentucky long rifle and the muzzle loading style rifles like the Brown Bess and, and things like that, there's pistols that are just pretty much the same as the rifles. They're just shorter. And you've got to pour the powder in, then put the patch, then ram it down, then go to the pan, pour powder in, you know, cock it back, and then you can fire. And then later on with the cap and ball, you do that same process with the bullet, but then you just put this little nipple on the hammer and that puts a charge down into the barrel, which ignites the powder, which forces the ball out of the barrel, and then... Later on, they have kind of shaped bullets, but it's still the same process. So on the frontier, and we're going to mainly talk about the Texas Rangers in Texas, they're fighting the Comanche Indians with these muzzle-loading style rifles, whether that be flintlock or cap and ball. So they are extremely outgunned when a Comanche warrior can fire three, four, five arrows in just a couple seconds and and lose a dozen arrows in the time it takes one ranger to reload his rifle or reload his pistol. And so that led to a lot of rangers carrying multiple weapons to be able to fire them in quick succession without having to reload. But still, 
say you were carrying five guns and you fired off five shots, it's going to take you five times longer to reload those weapons so that you can fire five more rounds. And the Comanches are riding at you and firing arrows quicker than you can even, you know, than you could even fire one in the first place. So the Rangers are looking for something that they can be competitive with the Comanche bow on the frontier. And Samuel Colt in 1835 comes out with what's known as the Patterson Revolver. It's a five-shot pistol, black powder cap and ball, but instead of having to do it singularly, there's a cylinder and it's got five rounds in it. Now, you still have to load each of those five rounds like a black powder kind of traditional muzzle loader, but once it's loaded, you can fire those five rounds in just one pistol. So if you're carrying two or three of these, you've got triple the firepower that you do if you were carrying five single muzzle-loading pistols you know, or, or a rifle. And so it really drew the Rangers to it. Now, he was trying to market it to the military, but it was kind of finicky. It was prone to breaking, and it was... It was kind of a fragile pistol, but the Rangers didn't really care because they wanted the firepower. And this was exemplified in Jack Coffee Hayes' battle with the Comanches on Enchanted Rock. He was able to hold off a much larger force of Comanches with just, I, he may have had two of them, but with his rifle and two of these Colt Pattersons, he was able to fend off until reinforcements were able to arrive just by himself. And it's the first battle where the Rangers had this pistol and fought the Comanches, and it changed war on the frontier for forever. The Rangers wanted more of them, and they went and tried to get as many as they could, but there were some problems with the Colt Patterson. Like I said, it was prone to breaking, it was kind of fragile, and so the Rangers wanted a more robust, tougher pistol they also wanted more shots so instead of five they wanted six shots also the trigger on the patterson was folding up so every time you cock the trigger the excuse me every time you cock the hammer the trigger would come down and so it was just kind of an unnecessary moving part within the revolver that was prone to break so in 1847 samuel walker traveled up to the Colt factory and spoke to Samuel Colt and they came out what's known as the Walker Colt pistol. It's this massive, massive pistol. It fires a huge black powder round and it's it, for a long time it was the largest, most powerful pistol in history. I think until like the Desert Eagle or one of the, you know, 357 Magnums or, or something like that. And this is what the Rangers were looking for. And the Rangers put it to good use right off the bat. They used it in the Mexican-American War. They used it on the frontier. And it's mainly designed as a Dragoon pistol. So it's meant to kind of sit in these holsters that go over your saddle. You don't really wear it on your hip. Although over the years, of course, you know, people did wear it on their hip. But that's its original design was a Dragoon pistol. On To be able to use it on horseback against these Comanches and other cavalry forces. Then you look at the problems with the Walker Colt. It had a little bit too big of a powder charge, and it was kind of prone to bust cylinders sometimes. And also the ramming lever that replaced the kind of wooden ramrod that you see on all the muzzle loaders, which is now at the bottom of the barrel of the pistol that you use to pack down the ball and powder, didn't have a catch latch on it. And so when you would fire it, that the power of the pistol would knock that lever down. So the pistols that came after the, the Walker Colt are known as the Dragoon series of pistols. And you got the first variation, the second variation, and the third model Dragoon. They all look very similar. They're all very similar to the Walker Colt. There's a little bit smaller in the caliber for the to make the charges a little bit lighter. The barrels are usually just a little bit short shorter. And there's a catch lever on the ramming on the ramrod lever. Excuse me. Then you go from there and the kind of more super famous of the Colt revolvers is the Colt Navy and the Colt Army that you see that was used by both sides of the Civil War. And the Colt Army was just a, had a little bit bigger of a caliber. The 
design was just a little bit different. The lever looked a little bit different than the Navy model. I think the Navy model is the most famous looking of this time period of the revolvers that Colt came out with. But these revolvers are still cap and ball. So you, every time you need to reload a cylinder, you have to load it just like you would a muzzle loading rifle, but you get six shots out of it. During that time period, some guys that were working for Colt, which would go on to form the company of Smith & Wesson, came up with the cartridge idea of having everything that's in that cylinder that you would have to manually load one at a time being in a self-contained cartridge, which we would call a bullet today. And you just slide that cartridge into the cylinder and then a hammer hits a primer on the back of the cartridge, which ignites the powder and then propels the bullet out of the barrel. And Colt rejected it because the Colt Navy and the Colt Army, they had the contracts with the military and they were selling great and people loved them. And so they went and formed their own company and they put a patent on the cartridge revolver itself. And so for 10 years, Colt could not make a cartridge revolver. And Smith & Wesson sold a lot of pistols during that time. Once the patent ran out, then Colt, which they had already had ready to go, released the Colt Peacemaker and it took off like wildfire. I think it's the coolest pistol in in kind of Wild West time frame. It's just, it's very iconic. It's robust. It's tough. It's what you think of when you think of cowboys. It's it's easy to handle. You know, I've, I've held them and I've shot them. They're easy to handle in your hand. They're easy to manipulate. They're easy to remove the cartridges. It's, it's a super simple design and I think it's better for it. When you look at the Smith & Wesson comparable pistols, they're a little bit harder to hold in your hand. They're a little bit more elongated. The hammer's a little bit further away, so you have to reach your thumb. Uh, they, there's some advantages to the Smith & Wesson pistols, don't get me wrong, and we'll talk a little bit more about them in just a second. But just for overall ease of use, overall usability, I think the Colt Peacemaker takes takes first prize in, in this category. And I think that's why you see it in all of the movies. There's probably, you know, people people like it. It just It's a cool-looking pistol, and in the movie, you see almost, almost everybody is using some variation of the Colt Peacemaker. They came out with a cavalry model. They came out with an artillery model. Later, they came out with a frontier model. And they all have little variations. You know, the barrels might be a little bit longer or a little bit shorter. Or the front sight's just a little bit different. Or it takes a different cartridge. But it's essentially the exact same gun throughout all of the production of the Colt Peacemaker. And... The, way, the ones you see in the movie, I think, are a little flashy. They have kind of the nickel-plated ones and things like that. Almost all the guns in the movie are kind of nickel-plated. And I've never been a huge fan of nickel-plated guns. I just think they look a little... It, this is just my personal opinion. I think they look a little fake. They look a little showy. They look a little too Hollywoody. When you look at the actual pistols from history that are in museums, or you, know, you can just go on the internet and find them, they are all a little bit rougher looking a little bit more rugged looking they've got the blue finish on them they've got you know kind of just wooden handles or that kind of like black hardwood on them for the original you know kind of single action armies and i just think that that looks more real to me now not not to say that there weren't nickel plated guns in the west of course there were and people did use them i just think when everyone is carrying a nickel plated gun it just looks a little flashy and the old west was dirty and gritty and grimy and and I just think that that kind of it's a little bit of a misrepresentation when everyone's carrying a nickel-plated gun. So now we'll talk a little bit more about the Smith and Weston. Excuse me, I always say that the Smith and Wesson. And the main Smith and Wesson that you're going to see in movies and especially in Tombstone itself is the Model Three. The Model One, the Model Two were kind of the stepping, the starting point for what would become the famous Smith & Wesson gun. And the Model 3 is what you see in this movie and what was really kind of the main competitor for the Colt Peacemaker during this time. And the main advantage to the Smith & Wesson is that at the top of it, you can break it open, take the cartridges out, and put more cartridges in, and then snap it shut, and then you're good to go. On the Colt Peacemaker, there's kind of a lever rod that you have to push out each cartridge individually, so reloading's a little bit slower. But the Smith & Wesson 
had its main drawback was that it had a bullet that only the Smith and Wesson could use. It was basically a 45 short Colt. And so you could fire the Smith and Wesson ammunition out of the Colt Peacemaker, but you could not fire other ammunition in the Smith and Wesson, meaning you had to buy these bullets specifically from Smith and Wesson and nothing else would work in them. So when we talked about one of the advantages of the Colt Peacemaker, especially the Frontier, when it was chambered in 4440, it's the same round that goes in your rifle as in your pistol. And it, and even if you were using just a regular 45 long Colt pistol, there's other guns that use the 45 long Colt. So these bullets were compatible across multiple platforms, which made ease of use much easier. And that's one of the reasons why Colt got the Army contract and Smith & Wesson didn't is because these bullets weren't compatible with other things. So that's kind of one of the drawbacks to the Smith & Wesson. And it's a single action as well. A lot of people think that the Smith & Wesson is a double action revolver that you can just pull that trigger because it does, the way it's built, does kind of look like early double action revolvers. But it itself is a single action. You got to cock the hammer back, pull the trigger. Cock the hammer back, pull the trigger. The main draw to the Model 3 is the brake action and the ease of reloadability. And it was widespread. There's a lot of famous figures from the Western time period that used the Smith & Wesson, at least at one point in time. Billy the Kid is said to have used the Smith & Wesson. Jesse James is said to have used it at one point in time. Pat Garrett. This is the pistol that we know that Wyatt Earp was using at the gunfight at the OK Corral. He was not using the Buntline Special, which we talked about in uh, the episode. That's a fabrication. It's just a myth. Uh, he was using a Smith & Wesson Model 3 for the gunfight at the OK Corral. And we know that some of the, all of the Cowboys were using Colt Peacemakers, and we're not, and we know that Doc Holliday was using at least a version of the Colt Peacemaker, and we're not sure who, what, what kind of weapons some of the, some of the other uh, figures were using. Now, moving on, we're going to talk about the Winchester Rifle Model 73. This is known as the gun that won the West. They sold something like 720 to 750,000 of these rifles over the initial time period that they were making them. It is a super popular rifle. Winchester makes good rifles. It's rugged, it's tough, and it uses the same round as the Colt Peacemaker, the 4440, meaning that guys on the traveling light like texas rangers u.s marshals you know even the even the bad guys the bandits and the outlaws they all only have to carry one type of bullet with them it makes it super super easy and people loved it and they gravitated towards it and they bought them in droves the winchester rifle is carried by mcmasters and a turkey creek jack johnson in the movie and it's the lever action classic cowboy looking rifle where it's got the lever and you cock it you fire and you cock it and you fire and they put the bullets on the side it's a super cool rifle i've always wanted one my dad had a lever action winchester but it didn't look quite like these kind of classic cowboy looking ones i've just always thought that the winchester rifles are just super super cool especially as somebody who has always loved cowboy movies and western history and, and things like that the next big gun that you see in the in tombstone is the double barrel shotgun and this is kind of like the the gun in the movie especially for the vendetta ride it's everywhere they're killing cowboys with shotguns across the the all of the last half of the movie full speed on their horses firing shotguns hitting people with shotguns the cl uh, the famous scene at the train yard when he shoots still well and then he gives that famous speech about hell coming with him to ike clanton you know he shoots him with the shotgun and these guns were in common usage especially for lawmen but where they really got famous was with the wells fargo company and the wells fargo company really kind of made famous the shotgun rider with the coach gun on their wagons, moving money to and from different cities and banks and, and things like that. And we know throughout history that Wyatt Earp and at, at the very least Morgan Earp were also Wells Fargo shotgun riders. So they definitely used it in history and they definitely would have used it in the, well, they used it in the movie as well. We know that Curly Bill Brocious was killed with the shotgun at the Battle of Iron Springs. So they... They're using all of the weapons that would have been used during that time period, and for the most part, they're 
using the right weapons that their characters in history would have been using as well. There is some, there are some differences, like we talked about Wyatt using the kind of bunt line gun and not using the Smith and Wesson. But we do see the Smith and Wesson. Sam Elliott carries a Smith and Wesson, and Wyatt uses the Smith and Wesson whenever he arrests Curly Bill for shooting Fred White. So you do see that gun in the movie. The guns in the movie are all more or less used correctly. I don't have a problem with the way they shoot and hold and fire the guns. The real problem is with how many times they fire the gun. You know, Doc Holliday fires a double-barreled shotgun three times at the OK Corral. Well, it only holds two rounds, right? And there's no scene of him reloading. And Doc Holliday shoots about 20 times during the shootout at the OK Corral. And everyone, there's just bullets flying everywhere. These guns all hold, well, the pistols all hold six rounds. Most of them would have just had five in them so that and they, the hammer is resting on an empty cartridge so it doesn't go off when you're riding. So I have a, I have a fairly big problem with that. In movies, I, as, if they show me a character reloading at least once, I just give it the benefit of the doubt to say, hey, they have paid us the service of these guys reloading to show us that they do reload. And then I can kind of say, you know what, the rest of it might have just happened off screen, right? I kind of give them the benefit of the doubt. But if you just never show me any reloading whatsoever, then I'm like, okay, you don't care. You're you're, you're just unlimited bullets. Everyone gets unlimited bullets. So I have a little bit of a problem with that. There's only a few scenes where that happens, but when it does happen, you can tell because it's like the storming in Normandy, you know, beachhead at, at the OK Corral with how many bullets they're they're firing. Now they did fire a lot of bullets, but not as many as in as in the movie. So we'll talk about the tactics just really short. There's not a ton of tactics, but what the cowboys kind of employ is kind of hit and run tactics, right? They're sneaking around, they're shooting from the shadows, they run they run away. And then, and then Wyatt proceeds to track them down. So it's really kind of a guerrilla war. It's asymmetrical warfare. They're out in the desert. They're riding around. They're tracking. They're doing all this. It's kind of circumstantial when they come up on people. You know, there's there's not really a whole lot to talk about the the tactics. I just kind of wanted to mention it that you know the the OK Corral is famous because that doesn't happen all of that much. When you say, "Hey, meet at the meet on the street at noon, and we're going to have a you know." A gunfight. So that's one of the reasons why the OK Corral is is famous, is because that happened, and these guys met on the street. They lined up and they went at it. So the rest of the the rest of the kind of tactics aren't are just kind of lawmen tracking and finding the guys, and then and then a fight ensues from there. So this is kind of a short one. Um, if you like pistols and you like uh, Western movies, I hope this was a little bit enlightening to kind of the history of some of these pistols and why they were used and why they were popular and, and you know and, and then why we see them in these movies. So I think it's kind of cool. Uh, let me know what you think, and then we'll move on to uh, the next film, and we'll talk about some of the sim- similar things with that one. All right, I hope everyone is doing well. Don't forget to follow us, and don't forget to find us on Instagram. Comment what you like, what you don't like about the episodes, and uh, we'll talk to you later. Adios.